Is it fair to link the worst anti-Semitic uh, terror attack in U.S. history to the midterm election campaign? A 46-year-old man described as angry and confused faces the death penalty if convicted in the killing of 11 worshippers at a Pittsburgh synagogue. Will it become like France and elsewhere where police guard Jewish places of worship? The shooter may turn out to be a loner, but there's a context. He was active on at least one far-right social media site. And then there's the President of the United States, the ultimate guarantor of safety and public order, accused of stoking hate and purveying conspiracy theories. Last week at a rally ahead of next Tuesday's midterm elections, Donald Trump, for the first time, branded himself a nationalist. Critics wonder if he means white nationalist. He has since ordered troops to the Mexican border to stop a migrant caravan from Central America. Two weeks ago, Trump tweeted a video that claimed without proof to be of someone connected to billionaire liberal George Soros handing out cash to migrants. Soros, who's Jewish and who's the cornerstone of many a conspiracy theory peddled these days the world over. Not just in Soros' native Hungary, whose leader proudly touts illiberal democracy, nor are hate crimes against minorities the sole domain of the extreme right, The worst in recent memory was the 2016 Orlando nightclub shooting targeting homosexuals. One week after a spate of foiled pipe bombs mailed to politicians, the shooting last week of two African-Americans at a Kentucky supermarket, are we witnessing the start of an era where unfiltered hate speech, well, just generally breeds terror attacks? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at hate and politics. Joining us from the U.S. Capitol, Washington Post columnist, Christine Enba, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. U.S. Attorney Michael Ostroff is with us as well. How are you? Very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. And Fabrice Epelbois, we welcome him back. He teaches uh, at uh, Sciences Po, the French Political Science Institute, uh, co-founder of Yoko Shah. Remind us again what Yoko Shah is. It's a cybersecurity consulting firm. Cybersecurity consulting firm. And we're going to be talking about uh, the Internet and free speech during this show. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. Anti-Semitic attacks had been on the rise before the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Owen Barnell has that story. Eleven names, eleven stars for the victims of the worst anti-Semitic attack on American soil. Here in Squirrel Hill, Pittsburgh's Jewish neighborhood, residents who say they've never felt threatened before are stunned. Uh, Shock is the best way to put it. The fact is that Jewish Pittsburgh is one of the safest Jewish communities in the United States. At a rally in memory of those who died, members of the Jewish community are worried that something in American society is changing. I don't feel it in person. On the internet, I do see it a lot more. But I feel like it's not more, it's simply that they're louder and noisier and easier to notice. But I don't feel like there's more of it, just easier to see. According to a recent census by the Anti-Discrimination League, Anti-Semitic acts shot up by 57% in 2017, with 1,986 recorded incidents. Above all, threats and harassment is on the rise, with 1,015 cases in 2017, whereas assaults have halved from 36 to 19 cases. Anti-Semitic abuse reached its peak last year in the Charlottesville riots, where white supremacists chanted with impunity, Jews will not replace us. For members of this university, there are consequences to Donald Trump's rhetoric, despite the president's pro-Israeli stance. Even if Trump himself is not singling out Jews, or maybe he himself doesn't even think in terms of Jews, but there are white nationalist groups that when they hear him speak this way, they think it's a wink. Against a backdrop of controversy, Donald Trump will travel to Pittsburgh on Tuesday. Multiple leaders of the city's Jewish community have said he is not welcome, as long as the American president does not more explicitly condemn white nationalism. Michael Ostroff, uh, many American Jews who live in Paris, they're a little shocked when they first see police guarding uh, Jewish places of worship, uh, Jewish uh, daycare centers and, and, and the such. When you see what's going on in the U.S., what are your thoughts? It's obviously very upsetting uh, seeing what's happening in the U.S. right now, the, the latest shooting. 
when I look at it from the perspective of, a, of an American Jew living in Paris, however, I uh, see it part of a worldwide problem, not part of a local problem anywhere. Uh, we have the same topics arising everywhere. We've got anti-immigrant rhetoric all over the place, and minorities, whether Jews or otherwise, are the targets of attacks, and unfortunately, in the United States. It's not a Pittsburgh-specific or a U.S.-specific problem. It's a worldwide problem. It's a worldwide-specific problem, absolutely. And I think in the, U in the U.S., one thing we see is you add guns into the mix. Uh, uh, fortunately, we're fortunate in Europe, in the most, for, the, for the most part, that people who want to do something are not going to have access to weapons like that. How do you explain it? Uh, un unfortunately, in some ways, it can't be explained. Uh, you're going to have crazy people who are going to go uh, over the edge uh, at all times. I do see, however, uh, a situation where historically uh, we've seen um, movements against refugees, uh, against minorities, and whenever you have that, there are going to be people who pick up on that. And I think we haven't learned the lessons of between World War I and World War II when there were minority groups that were not being protected, and we saw things spiral out of control. And now we're seeing it again. And it's not focused only on Jews. Of course, the latest incident is. Uh, but we see it uh, with, uh, in Europe, in particular, uh, Arab immigrant populations. In the United States, uh, whether it's uh, blacks or Hispanics, uh, uh, everyone's being targeted if they don't fit a certain model. Christine Emba, here we are, one week before the U.S. midterm elections. How would you characterize the mood in the United States? Stressed, I think, is the, the clearest word that comes to mind right now. Uh, it's been a bumpy run up to the midterms as is. Uh, President Trump has been a remarkably and unusually divisive uh, force going into the midterms after the Brett Kavanaugh uh, debacle uh, over the Supreme Court. But these pipe bombs, the shooting, these uh, extreme acts of savagery, I think have uh, injected an, an aura of confusion, sadness, and hopefully uh, pressure to do something into the voting populace, but we'll have to see next week. And how do you explain the Pittsburgh shooting? Uh, I think, like my colleague said, it's um, in some ways unexplainable, uh, inexplicable, this sort of violence. But I think many commentators have been pointing out that there does seem to be a quite close tie uh, between the rhetoric that our president has been spouting, uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric, um, anti-Semitic dog whistles in the forms of accusations against George Soros and globalists uh, controlling the State Department. And yes, he has followers who are, he would say, passionate, uh, some would say unhinged, who do hear these things and then think that by taking an action like this, uh, by attacking a synagogue, by shooting minorities, by being violent, they are acting on what their president would want. Do you blame Donald Trump, Fabrice Appelbois? Donald Trump is more a, a side effect than the, the real core problem. In, in my view, the core problem here is that the United States has been exporting its First Amendment on a massive global level. The First Amendment, which is the right to free speech. The right to free speech, which is in France really extreme, seen as extreme, um, and uh, has been exporting that all over the place. Uh, yeah, because, for instance, we in France have um, laws that uh, we punish hate speech. We have more than 400 different laws punishing free speech in many different ways, although we're not an attorney regime yet. But uh, free speech in the way of the American Constitution is quite unique to the American Constitution, but in the way of Facebook and Twitter and social media exporting that all over the place, this is deeply disrupting everything. It started in Tunisia with the Arab Spring, and today we're witnessing the effects on uh, Western democracies, and it's dreadful, totally dreadful. It is How so? Um, in a very simple way. Uh, the way Facebook makes money is by having you engage on their platform. The best way to engage some, uh, somebody on such platform is by promoting hate. Uh, if you're arguing 
nastily with somebody on Facebook, you will spend time on Facebook, you will generate some revenue on Facebook. And all those social networks try to um, enhance the way they make money. And the best way to make money is to having people divided and fighting each other. It's going to take them a lot of time. And the, the Facebook algorithm, which basically is a really sophisticated AI-powered algorithm, not is that and is uh, doing everything it can to have you spend more time on Facebook, which means to have you argue more and more, hate more and more, and divide more and more. And Facebook is really becoming a hate machine. And, and not just Facebook. Uh, Michael Ostroff, uh, there are limits on the First Amendment. You're not allowed to shout fire in a crowded movie house, for instance, right? Sure. Um, there, the, and ultimately, I think the limit, which is interesting in light of what was just said, is the limit on, uh, on fighting words. Right? I mean, that's uh, traditionally the ultimate limit in the First Amendment is uh, words that are so strong that they're going to actually push someone to act to violence. Uh, is where the line has been drawn. And I think there are sometimes we do see things on social media which does have this magnifying effect where one can question whether uh, lines need to be drawn. And I think Facebook and others should be able to be more they aggressive at they, stopping they, It's at totally impossible. That. There are 2 billion people using Facebook. There are a few thousand employees. It's totally impossible. It's like uh, having a 200 police officers in the whole United States. It's totally impossible to have law and order. It was uh, such a company. Christine Embo, we know on this side of the Atlantic that you have lots of conversations about the Second Amendment. Are there now conversations taking place about the First Amendment? Well, I don't, I don't know that there are conversations in terms of, you know, changing it severely. I think that the right to free speech is something that Americans value very highly. Uh, it is unique to America, but that's, that's something that we're proud of. That said, I do think that the influence of social media, as has just been discussed, um, is really turning this debate and turning that amendment into something that we've never really dealt with before. Um, as our my co-debater said, you know, Facebook and Twitter, um, they do run on sentiment. Uh, and the sentiments that tend to invite the most interaction, the most retweets, the most shares, are those of anger and of fear. Um, but at a certain point, I think Facebook and Twitter have lost the ability to sort of control uh, what they pulled together. And they also, um, unlike in the past, allow previously isolated, um, previously out there sort of on the edges, fringe elements to find each other, find each other, come together, self-reinforce and spread um, their anger and fear to much wider audiences. Uh, this connecting, uh, this connection element is something new uh, and it's hard to see where it's going to go. Uh, something new, well, it's been around for like a decade now. Uh, uh, Christine, uh, is it a learning curve and we're all going to learn how to use it better? Or is there a real push to have regulation of uh, social media? You know, in the U.S., there's been uh, quite a rec uh, recognition that social media is doing things that we don't want, whether interference in the elections um, with social media propaganda, uh, bots controlled by Russia or other organizations to disrupt real sentiment. The problem is that we don't actually know what regulations would work best. Um, the leaders of Facebook and Twitter and other social media organizations have been called to speak in front of Congress multiple times, um, have said that they are working uh, to tone down their networks to try and make them more healthy. Uh, but they're almost as behind as we are. Fabrice Pellebois? There's another major problem to add here. It is that you don't have one regulation to think about. We're talking about 190. 150 countries using Facebook, 100 and different, different regimes, uh, going from Saudi Arabia to uh, Nor Norway, uh, from the iconic democracies to the worst dictatorship. And all of those political regimes will want sooner or later to have Facebook to adopt their views. And they're very different. And there is no way one central company, especially a private company, is going to do law and order in 150 different flavors. All right. In the case of the shooter in Pittsburgh, um, he was a fan of this social networking site that 
uh, is unknown to many called Gab. Uh, so it wasn't Facebook in this instance. It wasn't Facebook. It was just a social media without the uh, the authority or the means to uh, to provide have law and order. Have you heard of Gab before? No, I've never heard of this one before. But we have similar stuff in France. And uh, basically in France, many of the far uh, left movement uh, tend to go on a uh, platform like Discord, and uh, many of the far right movement tend to go on Russian platform like VK. Russian platform like VK. Gab. Yes, um, Gab. I think is an American-born phenomenon, and it's actually a reflection of this problem, uh, this question that these networks have about deregulation and how to best uh, regulate the conversations. Twitter and Facebook were criticized for uh, perhaps hiding or shadow banning what was termed conservative content or conservative opinion. And in response to that, uh, many on the far, far right decided to form their own platform, Gab. Uh, and that's almost totally deregulated. And that is now where sort of the worst speech uh, foments without control. And because it can't be watched, because it's hard to track everybody who is there, discussions are being had, uh, plots are being hatched, and often we don't know until it's too late. These serve as echo chambers, they're self-reinforcing, uh, and there's no correction internally, so those eventually make it out into the open. Michael Ostroff uh, here, here in France, and Fabrice has been on a lot of times to discuss with us when there were terror attacks back in 2015 about forums and chat groups where people... Uh, uh, got together to plot effectively. Uh, so what do you do at this point in time? If this is cross-border, if this is worldwide? I, I, I wish I could say I was the greatest expert in, uh, in, uh, in social media and in this particular type of action, but I was intrigued by a couple of things that were said. So first of all, the, this comment that Christine just made regarding the, um, uh, the fact that these social media sites especially the ones on the margins, bring people together for them to foment their own ideas. Echo chambers. Echo chambers, if you will. They're also, they then have to be a source also for law enforcement. They have to be a source uh, to be able to see and for, the, and for the state to be aware of what's going on in order to protect its communities. And, uh, and the other thing was the mention of artificial intelligence as the way that these sites are run. Well, artificial intelligence also needs to be, uh, the algorithms need to be amended also in order to be able to follow these things and to see. And obviously, depending on which you one mean, of the 150 you want countries to be made by an algorithm? Uh, do this I want justice shame. to be made? No, 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 of course not. But um, uh, Law and order, regulation? But, it's already been made by artificial intelligence, especially in uh, the States. I'm, but I'm, it, not, I'm not talking about law and order. What you said before was that the algorithms are set right now in order to generate more hits and more views yeah. and more anger there is. I'm saying if the algorithms can work that way, the algorithms can also be... Uh, adjusted. Uh, in I order, think Wall Street uh, will not appreciate that, honestly. And we all know that, and it will not happen since Wall Street will decide which way Facebook will go. Yeah, but if it becomes a national security issue like it did in France in 2015... Honestly, it's, it's a national security issue for many countries, not only the United States. It's also a trade issue because there's supposed to be in the United States something against monopoly, and obviously Facebook is in a monopolistic situation, so is Google. And nothing is done. So I, I'm not sure the justice is able, as of today, to uh, grasp the problem. And I'm not sure the American justice should grab my French problem. And I'm not sure Germans next door want Americans to grasp their problem. This is a, a major geopolitical shift. We are seeing uh, entire um, public opinions all over the place uh, seized by Facebook, regulated by an American Law. The Americans uh, owning the but internet and making the rules. We're going to pick up. We're going to pick up uh, uh, Christine on these points when we come back. We're going to take a very short break. You're watching the France 24 debate. <music> welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're looking at uh, the worst uh, anti-Semitic act in U.S. history in Pittsburgh over the weekend and what to do about uh, growing violence uh, that seems to be uh, spawned from growing hate speech. With us to talk about it, uh, Washington Post columnist Christine Emba, who joins us from the U.S. Capitol, U.S. Attorney Michael Ostroff, who is 
been living in Paris for 20 years. 20 years, 20 years. And Fabrice Bedouin teaches at the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po and is the co founder of uh, Cyber Security Consultants, Yogo Shah. Uh, Christine, just before the break, we were uh, discussing uh, again. What to do in the case of the Pittsburgh shooter, uh, you can call him a loner, but he was on these websites interacting with others. So he's not quite a lone wolf at all, in fact. And uh, I know that in the United States, a lot of people have been looking towards Europe and uh, the European Commission to see how they're going to regulate social media giants. You heard Fabrice Appelboin say that it's a David versus Goliath struggle and that, well, the Americans are going to win the argument, is what he's saying. It is a David versus Goliath struggle, but we also have seen that when regulated in other countries, uh, Facebook and Twitter and other social media sites have been forced to change how they operate, at least in those places. The question is whether the American uh, government has the will to enforce these changes. But also there's the fact that, yes, social media is a problem. That is a place where hate can spread and people can connect to talk about it. But behind that hate, behind these social media uh, postings, is the influence of society overall. Hate has always been a factor. Anti-Semitism has existed for probably as long as we have. Um, But there is a difference when the president, when the party in power uh, allows this to uh, be done in his name or based on statements that he has made and does not firmly condemn it, does not push back against it uh, at his rallies and in his discussions, hints that it's okay. Um, That has really, I think, changed the tenor of the conversation because instead of being a fringe debate, uh, those people feel that they're entitled to say this in the open, that it's normal, that it's acceptable. Uh, And that is one thing that needs to change. The White House uh, strongly uh, blows back against that criticism. Uh, The press secretary, uh, Sarah Sanders Huckabee, was asked about hate speech at a briefing on Monday. The very first thing that the president did was condemn the attacks, both in Pittsburgh and in the pipe bombs. The very first thing the media did was blame the president and make him responsible for these ridiculous uh, acts. That is outrageous that that would be the very first reaction of so many people across this country. I'm not finished. The only person responsible for carrying out either of these heinous acts were the individuals who carried them out. It's not the president. No more than it was Bernie Sanders' fault for the individual who shot up a baseball field of congressional Republicans. You can't start putting the responsibility of individuals on anybody but the individual who carries out the crime. So, Christy Nemba, if you like Donald Trump, you're convinced by what you just heard. If you don't like him, uh, you're not. Where does that leave us? Honestly, I'm not sure that that's even the case. I don't know that anyone is actually convinced by those statements. We talked a little bit earlier uh, about the idea of incitement, of fighting words, Um, in the First Amendment. And there is a clear connection uh, between what Donald Trump and his uh, subordinates say and these attacks. Just look at the pipe bombs. Uh, Trump has called CNN the enemy of the people. Uh, He has said that Hillary Clinton needs to be locked up. Um, He says that George Soros is somehow controlling the government, or at least uh, hints at that and supports people who do. And then a Donald Trump fan, a Donald Trump supporter, in his name, sends pipe bombs to George Soros, to Hillary Clinton, to CNN. Uh, I think the connection there is obvious. Uh, It's impossible to deny. Uh, Sarah Beth Sanders is very good at avoiding the point, but I think the connection is clear for anyone who has eyes to see. Uh, There was an open letter that was sent to President Trump on Sunday, uh, Michael Ostroff, in which uh, uh, this was by Pittsburgh uh, Jewish uh, leaders who said Trump um, has emboldened a growing white nationalist movement. He's not welcome until he fully denounces white nationalism. Do you agree with that? Um, I I think that President Trump should seize the opportunity here to speak out a lot more, yes, to condemn white nationalism, and yes, to recognize the fact that he has a bully pulpit more than any president in the history of the United States has had a bully pulpit. Uh, He has uh, shown himself to be extraordinary at the use of Twitter, 
his rallies, he, he is speaking to his constituencies. We heard him speak out against these attacks. We heard him reference the fact that his daughter is Jewish, her son-in-law is Jewish, his uh, grandchildren are Jewish. I'm hoping that it can serve as a wake-up call and be a moment where he will actually use his bully pulpit to speak out more. But then again, it's, it has to be something that's not just uh, speaking out against anti-Semitism. I'd like to see him use the bully pulpit to realize, hey, take stock and say, um, maybe we're crossing too many lines here. We need to start hating everyone else. We need to start loving our neighbors a little bit more. And maybe we'll have a safer world. Fabrice Pelboin, when this is going on in the U.S., this build-up to the midterm elections, French people see it as not their problem? Or Most French people have no idea what the midterms are. <laughs> uh, but basically, I think uh, French people see that it's a good thing it's happening in the U.S. first. Because if this crisis started somewhere else, the United States would not care at all until it reached them. So now they realize there's a huge problem with Facebook. There's a huge problem with all those huge internet companies. And something must be done. Um, and something that is not about regulation, because it's a good thing to regulate, but there will no, uh, be no means to regulate. Uh, you need billions of dollars weekly to regulate Facebook today, because there are billions of people using it on a daily basis. Okay, so let me ask you concretely here. We just had a presidential election in Brazil. The opposition candidate, uh, uh, on the basis of reporting that was done by uh, one of the Sao Paulo newspapers, um, complained about mass messages that were sent Which out over were WhatsApp. Probably done by uh, the same Stephen Bannon and the same Cambridge Analytica who did well, the yes. Brexit and who did Trump's election. This is the same thing happening all over the world. Probably you, you have. You have you, uh, th there's an investigation done by uh, a Alleged. prominent journalist in, in Telerama who is a real specialist of this topic. Uh, there have been numerous publications uh, in uh, Brazil uh, mentioning, uh, re uh, re mentioning meetings between Stephen Bannon and the right-wing candidate. So obviously... So what should Brazil do the next time it holds a presidential election? If it holds a presidential election, <laughs> uh, it's the same question for every democracy on earth. What, what can we do? Well, the very first thing, and it has no relationship whatsoever with social media, is do not use electronic voting machine because those are hackable, all of them. Uh, the second would be I have no answer. Something's going to happen using social media in every upcoming election everywhere in the world because it's very cheap. It's extremely cheap. So if you have no cheap. answer, are you saying that this is going to undermine democracy for It good? is. It is definitely. It, it took $3 million to totally disrupt the Brazilian election. It took maybe 10 times this amount of money to disrupt the American election using Cambridge Analytica. That's nothing compared to the billion dollar budget of an American election. It doesn't cost anything. You can do it by yourself with a bunch of friends. You can do it if you're a small company, you can of course do it if you're a foreign state, whether it's uh, the Russian, or, or, or of course, who've been busted many times, or Israel, who's been busted by Bloomberg and the New York, New York Times, uh, interfering in the very same way the Russian did uh, in the American election. Every country is going to interfere in its neighboring country's election because they have an incentive to do that. And as soon as, uh, as long as Facebook is alive, or Twitter is alive, and Let's face it, they will be alive for many time. Uh, this will happen. Christine Emba, is the legitimacy of the vote that's going to take place one week from today in question? I don't think so, actually. Um, after the 2016 election uh, and the interference that was found there, uh, the federal government and the voting commissions have taken special steps to uh, try and control the influence of uh, outside actors on at least the voting machines and voting booths. Uh, what is in question, actually, though, is the question of voter suppression uh, inside the United States in Republican-controlled uh, districts, uh, making it harder for people of color, uh, for minorities, for those who they think might vote Democrat to actually get to the polls uh, to be able to use their voting rights. How, how wide a phenomenon is that really, though? Is it something at the margins for a tight race or is it something massive? 
Um, you know, it's hard to say, and it will be hard to determine what effect it has had until the midterm election uh, results are revealed. Uh, but the Voting Rights Act, uh, large parts of it, frankly, were struck down quite recently, um, allowing governments to sort of go their own way in regulating uh, their voting procedures. And that can make a difference, especially in these tight races uh, in purple states, uh, counties and states that flipped to Trump and have a chance to flip back. Uh, but that is also something that undermines, I think, faith and trust in the government. When people think that their vote might not be counted, that they might be prevented from going to the polls, they in essence think that their vote doesn't matter. Uh, and that does cause them to, I think, step back from democracy, to not engage in our society. And that makes these problems worse. It allows space for uh, these things to grow. All right. Uh, lots of reactions coming in, by the way, on the hashtag F24 debate. This one, the caravan hysteria and the talk about repealing birthright citizenship is both a distraction meant to rally the base for the midterms as well as a cudgel to terrorize the most vulnerable. Yeah, this caravan, and we had the news that came in late Monday where the U.S. president uh, ordered the deployment of some 5,000 soldiers to stop what he calls an invasion at the Mexican border. Allison Sargent has more. U.S. police hold drills at the border with Mexico. By the end of the week, they will be joined by over 5,000 U.S. troops. That is just the start of this operation. We'll continue to adjust the numbers and inform you of those, but please know that's in addition to the 2,092 that are already employed from our National Guard, Operation Guardian Support, that's been so effective. Civil rights groups have denounced the move as a waste of taxpayer money intended to terrorize. Ahead of next week's midterm elections, the U.S. president has been doubling down on his anti-immigration rhetoric, characterizing groups of migrants headed north as an invasion of the country, a line echoed by his supporters at Republican campaign rallies. As President Trump made clear, this is nothing short of an assault on our country, and we will not allow it. Mexican authorities have been struggling to deal with the groups of migrants traveling north from Honduras. On Sunday, one young man was killed in a standoff with police who had blocked a border bridge separating Mexico from Guatemala. On Monday, the group of several hundred Central American migrants successfully crossed the river into Mexico. Her father works in transportation. That's where he got a death threat. We didn't have the money to pay smugglers, so we decided to join the caravan. A larger caravan of 7,000 people made it to Mexico late last week and is slowly moving north to the U.S.-Mexico border. The group now numbers less than 4,000, after nearly 2,000 people applied for asylum in Mexico and hundreds of others decided to turn back. Michael Ostroff, you were here in, in France back in uh, uh, 2015 when there was this mass influx of people mostly coming from Syria that were led into uh, to Germany via um, the border with uh, Austria and Hungary. Um, your thoughts when you, when you see how this is all unfolding ahead of the midterm elections in the United States? I think the timing is uh, unfortunate and people will grab onto anything for political expediency. So uh, we know that the reason these people were leaving Honduras was not in order to have any impact in the United States, it was protest against the Honduran government and the way they were treated and the lack of protection and safety that these people had there. So to see them unwittingly being turned into uh, tools for anti-immigration uh, proposals in the United States is unfortunate. Sending thousands of troops to the border to try to stop uh, a few thousand hungry, tired uh, refugees uh, is, is unfortunate. I, in terms of the comparison with Syria, uh, I think it's very difficult to, to compare the two in terms of people leaving a war-torn nation, uh, uh, yet the, the lack of a welcome on the other side is really where the problem is. Now, some of the calculus, Christine Emba, if we're talking in purely cynical political terms, is that a conversation about identity uh, is going to help Trump more than if you have a conversation on, say, health care. 
Absolutely. Uh, I think that's actually the key here. And I think that in some ways the media is not helping. I mean, let's get one thing clear. This is not an invasion. Uh, there are not, as the president and the Republican Party would like you to believe, uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, angry uh, refugees and perhaps Middle Eastern people trying to cross the border. Uh, no, it's families who are trying to uh, find a better life for themselves. These caravans are nothing new. Um, they've happened before. They usually peter out long before uh, these people even arrive at the border. But unfortunately, um, in a time period where, yes, President Trump has emerged as a divisive figure, uh, the Republican Party has few actual accomplishments to tout, uh, they do know that fear works, uh, that stirring up identity politics works. Um, and using this idea of a caravan, even if it's not even real, um, to divide people is something that they think will bring people to the polls. And that's what they've decided to rely on. And unfortunately, we're beginning to see uh, what that means. The Squirrel Hill shooter in Pittsburgh uh, said explicitly that he was um, shooting because he wanted to uh, kill those who were aiding the caravan. Um, there is no there is no invasion. There is no gigantic caravan. This is all fear mongering. Um, and yes, it's being done for entirely cynical reasons. Fabrice Pelboin, uh, here in Europe, uh, we saw the vote for Brexit as a backlash against uh, uh, the migration crisis of 2015 to a large degree. Mm. Um, there is this feeling that uh, the technology that's come into our lives that's gone cross-border the way you've so aptly described it, is disrupting people's lives and is, is uh, creating anxiety over what, their, what lies in their future. It is totally creating anxiety. It, it's, there are two camps, the, the fear camps, and unfortunately that's our camp. And there is the hate and anger camp. And that's the opposite camp, that's Trump camp. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to social media, a hate is a much more powerful fuel than fear. Fear is not going to incite you to take action. It's going to incite you to not do anything and wait fearly, uh, whereas hate is going to push you to action. So there is a definitive incentive given by social media to those who are able to grasp hate and who are able to weaponize hate, and Donald Trump is really good at that. And what do you tell your students now when, uh, when, the, when they're looking at these problems? I have the chance to teach an international class. So I have 15 different nationalities in my class, coming from Americans, Chinese, Brazilians, uh, everywhere. Uh, it's a great opportunity to have many different feedback, and all of them are pretty fearful, except for the Chinese. The only ones who look at that and who are confident that their future is going to be good, whatever are the Chinese. They already live in the surveillance state, a really harsh surveillance state, and it's just beginning here, either in the US or in France or everywhere else. The surveillance state is becoming a so reality. So when you have that surveillance state, as you describe it, I know, for instance, when you cross that new bridge, uh, you, they, they, they soon going to have a plan where that new bridge, it links uh, Hong Kong to Macau and the mainland mm -hmm. uh, to have facial recognition so you don't have to give your yeah, your, yeah. Uh, your your ID. But, but how, here, how is that going to impact social media? Is it going to make it, is it going to well, curb example, the in, state in, speech or is it going to make it worse? What's it going to be, what's it going to be in like? China, in China, there is no way you can connect to any kind of social media. Of course, you don't have access to Facebook, but you have access to many different social media, there is no way you can connect to those without having uh, disclosing your true identity. And there are nearly half a million people working for the state as watchdogs on social media, trying either to spread some news or to disrupt some news or to target some opposition. Half a million people. This should give us an idea of what do we need to keep law and order on Facebook. We need such amount of workforce. And there is no way... But hang on. When, we, when, when Twitter says, for instance, that they've uh, culled a lot of bots and fake accounts, mm. that's a good piece of good news, right? I'm not sure because it gives you the impression that something is being done and things are going to be fine, which is not true. Once again, on the Chinese social media, you need half a million people working daily in order to, to have law and order in the Chinese social media. So that's 
take a, it means that on Facebook you would need something like a million people working daily. Christine Ember, is it, is it a choice between uh, bots and uh, hate speech for flowing freely or a surveillance state? Those are two options that do seem to be looming in our future. I'm not sure that it is um, a choice between the two. I'm not sure that the latter, uh, that a surveillance state will even, you know, keep us safe from the former. Uh, I think it's true that as soon as Twitter and Facebook clear out one segment of bots, uh, another perhaps double amount springs up in their place. But I also do think that one of the things that they can do, and perhaps one of the things that governments and media should think about doing is really beginning to educate or try to educate uh, the populace about exactly what is going on on these sites, um, about the fact that, you know, there is some information that is not trustworthy. Uh, there are sources that you cannot rely on. And I do also think that people are coming to the realization that social media, uh, once seen as a boon, is maybe not as good for them uh, not as good for their lives as they previously thought. You know, at first we thought that connecting everybody would be a great idea, uh, that all of the connections would be positive. That's clearly not the case, and people are waking up to that. So maybe we will actually begin to move away from these networks, be a little bit more shy uh, about sharing this information. We will have to make those decisions individually, but hopefully I think with uh, social discussion, with a cultural understanding of what's happening, we can get a little bit better. And right, we'll leave it there for now. I want to thank you so much, Christine Emba of The Washington Post, for joining us from the U.S. Capitol. I want to thank as well Michael Ostroff and Fabrice Pelboin. Stay with us, though. Media Watch is next. Let me say hello to uh, James Creedon. James, Hi, we mentioned it's not just anti-Semitic attacks. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also uh, the targeting of minorities, and it's not just in the United States. That's right. A spate of homophobic attacks in France in the last number of weeks. Francois has been getting a lot of media attention. Uh, there was this demonstration uh, on the 21st of October where... Thousands of people turned out at Place de la République to denounce uh, uh, the spike in, uh, in homophobic attacks. And it wasn't just in Paris, although it seemed to start out in Paris. Uh, not that any of this was coordinated, but it did get a lot of media attention. Lille, Lyon, Rouen as well. And I, to speak about the role of social media or whatever uh, in, in all of this, uh, they do certainly help to draw attention to uh, incidents like this. You, I myself would have to wonder, is there a real spike or is it just a case that people are reporting it more now, talking about it more now, coming out and actually talk, uh, you know, sharing photos like this one uh, of uh, a broken nose, for example, after uh, an assault uh, in, uh, in Paris. Uh, there, there were others in, in, in the south of Paris. This guy got uh, smacked in the face. So you had Anne Hidalgo directly interacting with... The mayor of Paris. That's right. She directly interacted uh, with uh, that previous... Uh, image there uh, shared on Twitter, uh, encouraging him to go and uh, to uh, lodge an official complaint with the police. You had Emmanuel Macron, who spoke uh, yesterday also on uh, Twitter, uh, speaking about the need for human humanity and tolerance. Now, what's interesting here is a lot of uh, reactions online, people unhappy with the use of the word tolerance, saying, well, actually, it shouldn't really be about tolerance. Tolerance would suggest that it's uh, about uh, dealing with something that you fundamentally disapprove of, and really, it's more an issue of Equality. This is uh, Cécile uh, Coudreau of, um, of Amnesty International in France, and she says uh, we should be speaking more about respect and equality for the law uh, uh, than about tolerance. So uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, perhaps uh, the, his intentions were in the right place, but some feeling that, uh, that, uh, that the focus should be elsewhere in that regard, Francois. Uh, Fabrice, something that James said, uh, is it a case when it comes to these uh, homophobic attacks uh, where... It's uh, they're on the rise, uh, sparked by, as we've been discussing, the hate speech, or is it just that we're now in this era of full transparency where more very, stuff is getting reported? Very difficult to say, but if you look at the Me Too phenomenon, there's a huge spike in r reports of rape, and God, thanks God, if there's not actually, we're not witnessing a huge spike of rape in, in France. We're just witnessing... Uh, yeah 
people speaking openly when yesterday they used to shut up. Right. Up so let's hope, let's hope that this is the same thing. Let's right. really and hope another that. Another factor in France, I think, when there was when there was a spate of, a t of similar attacks back around the time of legislation in France for for um, uh, gay, gay marriage, people said, "Oh, this is a reaction to the legislation." And indeed, uh, there was uh, a sense at the time that because the legislation was quite progressive, it was provoking those. It was creating a kind of a culture war, if you like. That's not the case right now. There's nothing in the environment or in the news at the moment that you would think would uh, GPA, provoke. Yes. Uh, there is something. There's a GPA, right. which is the right for homosexual to have a, a baby uh, born from a, a third party. A third party. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's the, the big news. Okay. And it probably has something to do with that, unfortunately. Michael Ostroff, obviously it's anecdotal what I'm asking you in terms of uh, evidence, but what's your feeling in, in, in the general mood in France in that regard? Um, I, I haven't seen, in terms of a general mood on the street, uh, any. But change just in terms of or tolerance or, or the increase of hatefulness in in, in rhetoric and. Uh, I, I think we went through a bad period a couple of years ago uh, when things really spiked. My own sense, just and again, it's anecdotal, is that things had calmed down a little bit, and I was hoping that we we're looking towards a brighter future, but. We see that there's uh, at least more and more reporting and more and more visibility, which in and of itself is a good thing. We should be speaking about things when they happen. Uh, just to speak briefly, uh, Francois, about the online uh, factor and whether or not it foments uh, hate speech or at least creates, it does create, obviously, a, a much broader platform for it. Facebook, 2 billion users, and it really they have been realising uh, that, that uh, there is an increasing demand uh, for them to, to manage uh, trolls and hate speech online, that they have a responsibility in that regard. So they, they have set out set out or rolled out new anti-bullying tools. Uh, this was uh, announced a couple of weeks back and uh, which will allow for, uh, I suppose, deleting uh, multiple comments uh, more easily instead of having to delete comments one by one. You can, it's going to make it a bit, a bit more user-friendly, uh, a way of hiding or deleting multiple comments at once from the options menu of the post. And uh, so uh, they go on in this article in TechCrunch to say that uh, it mean, it, you shouldn't engage with disruptive commenters, but unfortunately, uh, that's how people tend to react. Mm. You have a, a hateful comment and it gets right up to the top of the comment section because people are reacting to it. So this is a way for Facebook to try to allow for that to be uh, demined, if you like, or, or, or uh, uh, taken out of the picture. Get this for a headline that's sort of... Uh, uh, striking. It took a, gen a genocide for Facebook to ban a country's military leadership. Now that's, I think, that's overstating the case. To, reference to Myanmar. It's re reference to Myanmar, where they uh, where they eventually agreed to delete uh, generals, Myanmar right. generals' uh, accounts or at least comments for hate speech. James Green, fomenting many thanks. For the, I want to thank as well our panel. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.